Hello, hello, everyone. Happy Thirsty Thursday. Welcome to another edition of Sip Scout. It is Thursday night, as most of these are, and we're looking forward to a delicious Thanksgiving meal uh, week next today. week. Yeah, yeah, it's crazy how quickly this um, holidays sneak up on us, even though they're at the same time every year. It's crazy how that happens. <laughs> so today, we're going to be talking about wine and other beverage pairings with all the delicious spread of the foods that you might find on the Thanksgiving table. Yeah, absolutely. We'll be talking about great food pairings for the holidays. So we'll talk a little bit about Thanksgiving and, you know, but also Christmas and New Year's and all these things and really just dive in deep for the tenets of food and wine pairing or food and beverage pairing, because it is something that we feel, you know, a lot of people think that they food and wine pair, think that they food and beverage pair simply because they often have a glass next to them while they're eating. You're eating and drinking at the right. same time, therefore. And, you know, one of the things we try to teach people is eating and drinking at the same time is not actually pairing. And so we'll talk a little bit about that tonight while <laughs> sipping on some delicious wines from Jack's Vineyards, one of our favorite mm -hmm. family family vineyards out there. Um, so we'll be telling you a little bit about them and sipping on their wonderful Y3 Chardonnay and Y3 Pinot Noir. And we'll tell you why these are two of our favorite holiday wines to have on our table. Um, there's a couple of reasons, actually. Very so. much so. Uh, but first off, for those of you who might not have been here before, I'm Evan. I'm a certified sommelier and uh, certified cider professional. Eh, whatever. Mixologist, uh, boozy expert. <laughs> wine is uh, my first love. Yes. And um, I'm excited to talk to all of you about wine tonight. And I'm Suzanne. I'm the founder of The Crafty Cask, where we are all about celebrating and supporting craft alcohol makers like the wonderful Jack's Vineyards and many others that we share through our Sip Scout kits. And speaking of Sip Scout kits, I like to, in the beginning of our sessions, give a quick little preview to our upcoming kit. And this next one that um, is coming out for it's December doozy. is an exciting one because it's our holiday mixology party. We always love this one. Yeah, so we do this every year. And you get your nice little sip scout report, of course. But here, yeah, maybe. Um, you're gonna get this, Allow me. this nice I'll be the Vanna. This nice kit here that has your spirits that you need, some really fun mixers for holiday drinks, some garnishes, some fresh limes. So everything you need to make two each of three holiday festive cocktails. And these are really fun We're cocktails about them. that Evan has created. So he over the past um week or so or a couple of weeks I guess it was a while back but he created a couple of fun recipes for us so the cocktails we're going to be whipping up for a little preview especially for those of you who aren't members if you want to get in on this kit um we're going to be making a spiced cranberry gimlet which is tart and fresh and wonderful um and then we're going to be making a s'mores old-fashioned which is my favorite like that's going to be yeah. that's going to be one of my cocktails winter, all right? season long Man. yeah um so the s'mores old-fashioned is really quite fun and then we'll also be whipping up a gingerbread espresso martini um and for those of you who've been following the crafty cast for a while you may remember that we often like to make our espresso martinis with rum instead of vodka um and so it has an even I don't know, more nuanced depth to it. Um, and so that's going to be a really fun one as well, especially with that gingerbread flavor in yeah, there. Yeah, ginger, it's, coffee. This yeah. particular rum has like pronounced molasses characters. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Very fun. So we're very excited. We always get all decked out in our holiday gear. I love the holidays. Evan is a Christmas Eve baby. So we have some festive stuff coming up for us. Um, so yeah, we get all decked out in the holiday gear and it's a great way to kick off the holiday season. We're actually gonna be doing that event on a Friday night um, to, to kind of help squeeze it in and have it a little bit earlier than usual, but make enough for two so you can invite your friends along, have a little mini holiday party of yourself, or you can grab it as a gift to send to someone for a gift. Yeah, so join us December 15th. I think so, Friday, yep. And uh, we'll teach you all about these delicious cocktails. Yeah. Oh my gosh, this more is old fashioned, but it's so good. Yeah, yeah, we're excited about that. <clears throat> but let's get back to our regular programming for tonight and talk a little bit about wine. Shall we do a little cheers, everyone? Hey. Thank you for joining us. Happy almost Thanksgiving. Mm. So, so, go ahead. Oh no, Jinx. You owe me a Coke. <laughs> You owe me a bottle of wine. <laughs> now go ahead. Um, yeah, the purpose of tonight's event is really to kind of talk to you about um, food and wine pairing primarily uh, with kind of the, you know, spotlight being on these two delicious and very versatile expressions of 
a Chardonnay or Pinot Noir and Chardonnay from one of our favorite producers, Jack's Vineyards. Uh, these are the Y3 bottlings, which is essentially any of the wines that they don't make from their own family estate. But um, food and wine is kind of the focus here. So please chime in and let us know what challenges you might have or uh, questions about the ideas of pairing food with, well, anything really. Wine is kind of the primary topic here tonight, but if it's something else that you're wanting to serve and have a bottle open on your table uh, and are curious what kind of foods mm -hmm. might you know, shine and, and show that particular beverage off because it's kind of a fun interplay. Sometimes the wine is the highlight and sometimes yeah. the food is the highlight and the food enhances the wine or the wine enhances the food. Um, and so, yeah. And so our goal for you for this holiday season is, you know, we all take pride in our food and make yummy food. And so everyone usually leaves talking about how good the food was, but this year we want everyone leaving your house or leaving the party that you're going to talking about how good that wine was with that food or how good that cider was with that food or how, you know, that like that's cause it can really enhance a whole meal. So we have lots to talk about when it comes to the food pairings. And I in particular have lots to talk about on this topic because I feel like you know, this is something I'm very passionate about. And over the years, living with a sommelier, living with someone who really knows wine and has been teaching me a lot about my palate, I've gotten quite good at finding food She's pairings. She's gotten and, so good. And I'm going to teach you a couple of tricks and how I've gotten good at it. Spoiler alert, drink a lot of wine, eat a lot of food. <laughs> Try stuff. <laughs> um, but yeah, I'm going to give you a few tips and tricks and we'll talk about that. But before we do that, do we want to talk, let's talk a little bit about Jack's Vineyards and these specific wines. So yeah. everyone's oriented. They know if they want to open one bottle or both bottles, they can figure that out. Um, and if you do want to open both bottles, but you don't want to drink both bottles tonight, um, yeah, grab our, our trick for saving bottles. You don't need a fancy Thing. You don't need anything to like make it expensive. Um, obviously, if you have a Coravin, for those of you, it's like a needle that you put in so you can just pour a glass at a time. That's your best bet, but that is a fancy expensive tool. Um, but if you don't have one of those, all you want to do is downsize your wine. So all this headspace here, maybe you can't see that one as well. Um, you know, that air in there, you don't want any air in there. So you want to downsize it to whatever size container. And, you know, this is a little bit more specifically purposed and maybe quote unquote, fancier than, yeah. uh, you know, your ball jar. But we've had but plenty of wine. But work just fine. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Any way you can remove the headspace and the oxygen or the air and the oxygen therein uh, is going to help preserve any kind of wine that you've opened. So if you want to open these tonight. Mm -hmm. And class, it really, if you do this, and if every time, if you only drink half of this, when you open this, downsize it again, right? And so if you keep doing that, and if you keep them in the fridge, even your red, um, they will stay good for, I'd say like oh, three days. Um, if you're really diligent about it, two yeah, or three days. Yeah. yeah. Um, and sometimes they kind of transform a little bit, but in a fun way. So you can have it one night and then the next night you say, oh, it is a little different, but that's kind of interesting that this note is coming out of it now, whereas it was absent last night. And so yeah. it can kind of be a fun experiment as well. So, but yeah, just keep in mind this, as Susanna, uh, you know, alluded to wine is perishable. And so like anything, you can keep a tomato on the counter until you cut it open yeah and once you open a bottle of wine air. it's probably better to put it in a container and put it in the fridge yeah absolutely so those are our tips so you can open both of these or if you're saving them for your thanksgiving meal that's okay too we'll talk to you about them and you'll learn all about them too. yeah uh so jack's vineyards uh is a winery that was opened and or created i guess by two siblings trent and kimberly jackson uh, for a while, it was called Jackson Ridge, and after a little while, they got a cease and desist letter from a, a winery that many of you may have heard of, Jackson Family Wines, uh, i.e. Kendall Jackson, and decided, well, instead of losing all our, you know, family's money by hiring attorneys that are going to yeah. immediately drain that by fighting it big company like Jackson Family Wines, they decided to change the name to Jack's. Uh, Jack's is located in- Which I feel like fits their personality so much more. It's kind of like fresh and young mm -hmm. and approachable. And Trent and Kimberly, the siblings who run this, are fresh and young and approachable and hip and cool and live in San Francisco. And, you know, so I feel like Jack's fits them perfectly. It would be funny for me to think of them as Jackson Ridge. Like that feels a little- Right. Formal. And Jackson Ridge was when, you know, they were up in Napa Valley and that's where they grew up. 
Um, and that's a fun part of their history. While they have a beautiful tasting room that kind of encapsulates Napa Valley right in downtown San Francisco, really close to the Giants Stadium. In fact, if mm -hmm. you want to, go to, a to grab a drink before going to see the Giants play. Um, <clears throat> but, you know, they were raised in Napa Valley and have a lot of close familial connections to winemakers and vineyard owners in Napa Valley. Uh, and that's one of the things that allows these two wines to come to life uh, in a pretty special way, as well as their estate wines. So again, Jack's as a brand has basically two brands. Um, the first is Jack's and that primarily encapsulates their estate wines. And then in more recent years, single vineyard wines. Uh, and then Y3 is a collection of wines that are made from vineyards across California, basically. Um, and it's curious because Y3 as a brand is actually literally from the family's brand of their cattle ranch. Um, they have a cattle ranch in the northern part of California and Y3 is how they would brand their cattle. So it's uh, quite literally a brand. Um, and these two wines and all of their wines, I feel like the Crafty Cask appreciates because of the value that is inherent uh, in the quality that you find for the price that you pay. Um, just to wet my whistle while I'm talking. There you go. This. And I'm gonna throw up a few pictures from Jax while you're while you're talking here. Cool. Um, as I mentioned, growing up in Napa Valley and the familiar connections that Trent and Kimberly and their father, Jess, I'm sorry, not Jess. I can't remember. It would be so disappointing. <laughs> It'll come to you. It'll yes. come to you. Let's leave Brain that. fart. <laughs> um, include their primary winemaker, um, a fellow by the name of Kirk Vengi. And who is Kirk, a rock star. Who is a rock star. In the in the winemaking world, yeah. people know his name for sure. Yeah, Kirk is um, the son of one of the, I guess, more important people in the lore of Napa Valley. Uh, Niels Vengi was the first winemaker to score 100 points. Um, at least the first American winemaker mm -hmm. to score 100 points when he was working at Groth in the 1980s. And his son Kirk is following very closely in his footsteps. He uh, runs a winery, his his own winery, that's simply called Vengi, but also makes wines for a number of other wineries in Napa Valley, including Jack's. And Trent and Kimberly and Kirk went to school together. And so- Like high school, right? Like young. Yeah, yeah. you know, uh, the Jackson family was growing grapes and selling them from their Calistoga estate uh, which is the very northern end of Napa Valley uh, for many years to other wineries. And Trent and Kimberly decided that they wanted to start their own winery and tapped Kirk to be their winemaker. And like, hey, we got this great fruit. We don't really know who else we'd, we'd, we'd rather have make it. Have right? make it. Um, and he said, okay, yeah. Yeah, and by I'll then he was already making these like hundred point wine, highly rated wines and things. Yeah, yeah. so um, Jets, I believe, started in the early two thousands, okay. um, and he hadn't been making wine for long. I believe that Vengi, uh, so a little bit of backstory. Um, Nils Vengi, his father, has a winery called Saddleback, and started a reserve label called Vengi. Um, for his, you know, higher echelon wines. And that existed for a while. And I believe 2003 is when Kirk um, proposed and essentially bought his dad out mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. said, I want to take that label and continue it. Uh, and that was around the time that he started acquiring these other roles as a winemaker or consulting winemaker sure. uh, in, in Napa Valley for brands like Baccio Divino and Bella Vigna and um, the sellers. There's a ton and they're all really good. Um, but the cool thing about Jack's is that because he's a family friend, um, 
these wines are remarkably well priced. Yeah. And that's always a beautiful find because craft anything. You find an art to it. It's yeah. Yeah. You find yourself getting into a territory where you're like, well, it's a little bit more than I want to spend, but I know it's going to be good because I've had it before. Right. And so that's a beautiful thing about Jack's wines and even more so white three wines is that these wines are made by someone that has such a precision and like a, a nose and a, a capability of making wines that if you've opened either of these, you can immediately tell the quality. Um, like the, yeah. And Kirk has kind of, I don't know, admonished Trent and Kimberly over the years. Yeah, the way I, the way I kind of remember it or like to hear it is that he basically goes to them at, like every couple of years and is like, listen, guys, you could be charging so much more for this and I could be charging you. Like, these are great. Like what these would get in the market if they would put a different label, you know? And they're just like, that's not what we're about, man. Like, we just want to make wines that are approachable. We want to make wines that are so good but that people don't like pause about opening it on a Tuesday night, you know, and that's what Kimberly and Trent's approach is. And certainly the Jack's vineyard line is hot because they're sing they're single vineyard a lot of times they're state fruit yeah. and, you know, things of that nature, but there's, you know, they're still very affordable. Yeah. They're for what um, they are like their cab. Yeah. They're Napa, they're Napa Valley cab, single vineyard. You know, it's the Jack's estate. Uh, I believe is $60 a Bottle, which you know that's maybe not it's not Tuesday night wine for most people but, but Napa cabs are usually like a hundred to find it to find a 60 <laughs> or to find a single vineyard Napa yeah. cab for under a hundred dollars is kind of a rarity and so yeah uh we esteem them um as being you know virtuous in that in that stalwart endeavor and you know Kirk's doing fine yeah yeah he's, he's... and Kimberly and Trent are doing fine they're like we don't need to make a ton more like it's yeah. okay like we're all doing good here yeah. and so we love that ethos because that's really what like I love about Evan's approach to wine you know there are plenty of wine people out there especially sommeliers who are very good at steering you to $250 bottles of wine that are going to knock your socks off, right? Like that's- It's that's, easy to find a right. bottle that's going to knock your socks off. At that price point. <laughs> and, you know, there's a lot of like snobbery in it and kind of, and Evan's approach has always been, I want amazing wines for good value, right? And he's he's done a really good job at like sniffing those out and finding those and figuring out what regions and what years and what, you know, he has a really good kind of, way about that and we can talk more about that way yeah later yeah and so this is one of our favorites and for the holiday table it's really great and actually oh that's a different minor we'll tell you about that deal after um but you know they often have really great deals where if you get a case they're really affordable things mm -hmm. like that so for the holidays they're killer they're great um the chardonnay you want to talk a little bit about the chardonnay i do i love the chardonnay partially I'd love to see in the chat if you guys want to throw in where you are on the spectrum of Chardonnays. If you like buttery Chardonnays or if you like lean Chardonnays or if you're kind of somewhere in the middle. Um, but for a long time, I was like anti-Chardonnay and probably because I lived in Northern California and a lot of the Chardonnays I was tasting were these kind of big butterballs. You know, that California got a very big reputation for Chateau two by four. Yeah. <laughs> Exactly. And and that was the California Chardonnay reputation for a very long time that it kind of hit you over the head with the butter and the malolactic acid and, you know, all that good stuff. And that's what people loved about it. And that really didn't work for me after a couple sips, a couple sips I could appreciate. But after that, it started to just like be too much for me. And this one. And so for a while, once I started finding the lean Chardonnays, which I found them by going to France. So Chablis, um, I find usually are much more lean and the way that they're made. And so I started really going in the other end of the extreme and saying like, that's the kind of Chardonnay I like. And now I've kind of settled out. I think I would say, would you agree? Like more towards the middle where I like a little bit of that butter, but I also like the sure. like stringent kind of crisp cleanness of it. And this one is like perfectly like that for me. I feel like it's right in the middle for me. Yeah, I, I agree. I think that that is kind of the direction that I, I've seen your palate go where since I've known you, like, yeah. super bright, crisp, lean Chardonnays. You're like, oh, that's Chardonnay. And that's a, a very common response to a lot of people that 
have been exposed to one type of Chardonnay. And, you know, Chardonnay is a really interesting animal. It's, um, it's a grape that inherently does not really have a lot of characteristics that are indicative of it, the grape itself. Um, it's a relatively neutral grape, uh, which is the reason why it's the primary grape that's used to make a lot of the best champagnes in the world. Yeah. Um, it's, which is kind of funny if you think about it, because when you think about Chardonnay and what it tastes like, and then you think about champagne and what it tastes like, like sure. they don't, they don't jive there's necessarily. A, there's a little, little conflict yeah. there. Yeah. And a, a big part of that is so because it's a relatively neutral palate, um, much of the, you know, I guess profiles, characteristics, you know, descriptions that you can find about it are primarily because of the way it's made. Uh, so it's a blank canvas, a template for the winemaker to kind of like draw his yeah. flourishing signature. Um, but when you're talking about champagne, and one of the reasons I bring this up is because when you're making champagne, you take Chardonnay and you ferment it and you ferment it hot and fast. And that kind of burns out even like the little bit of characteristics that the grape might have so that you have a even more of a bleached white palette and canvas for the champagne maker to show off what the you know yeah. techniques of making sparkling wine can or can contribute contribute um in the middle when you grow it in the right place and y3's chardonnay is grown in the los carneros region of napa valley this is the coolest region of Napa Valley, but one of the warmer climates with regard to the comparative elements that you find in uh, Burgundy. Um, by the by, Burgundy, Chablis, Suzanne mentioned earlier, both of those places, both of those wines are places and they're named, the wines are named for the place they come from, but they are made from Chardonnay. They're cooler climate though. And so they're a little leaner because the grapes don't get quite as ripe and therefore, they have a little bit more acidity. If you think about eating a, an apple that you have an, an apple tree in your backyard, you eat one in you know in October, and then you eat one in November, and the ripening that's occurred and the acidity that you find earlier compared to later in the harvest uh, gives the wine the same acidity. And this wine, I feel like, has a really bright acidity. Yeah, I agree. And it still has a little of that winemaking influence. And I think that that's the thing that's fun about this. One of the things that's great about Chardonnay is because of its spectrum, the versatility that you can find with different food pairings um, is pretty broad. That's one of the reasons that we're highlighting it here mm -hmm. today. Pinot Noir as well. Uh, when you're looking at the Thanksgiving spread or you know Christmas day feast, um, there's a lot of food on the table. Yeah, um, a lot of rich food. And and yeah, a lot of rich food, but just like some Different food that's a variety. Are, yeah. yeah, yeah, spectrum. And and like so, even like cranberry sauce. There's a lot of different types of cranberry sauce. Yeah. Like some people do we, the raw. We love mixing the, yeah. mixing it with with orange zest and peel and juice and like the for the whole, fresh one yeah. and then we also love one that's cooked that has mm -hmm. spicy red pepper flakes in it and fresno chilies in it and has like some real heat to it as well and i've had them that have ginger yeah. as a major component of them um and so you've got this whole palette of like flavors on on your table and having something that is acceptable is really or yeah. not acceptable but like uh pairs well with yeah, everything is, is, is really helpful yeah so um i want to talk about what's going on in the chat a little bit because i had something covering it for a minute i asked you guys to chat to me and then i had something covering it and wasn't even paying attention um yeah so buttery shards uh more minerally lean ones yeah and so that's where like depending on and especially if you're in a couple if one of you likes one and one of you likes the other finding those ones that kind of meet both is can be challenging another one that i feel like fits in this category is oh i just had the name and i blinked on it what's my favorite one with popcorn la rochelle yeah la rochelle chardonnays um are also something worth hunting out if you are looking yeah. for um, those are really fun delicious splurge. those are a little more buttery i would say typically i mean depends, not all of them yeah, yeah but the particular one but and um 
when it comes to buttery Chardonnay, so like I said before, I used to be like, no on the buttery Chardonnay, please remove Ron Bauer from me. Thank you. Right. And because Ron Bauer is known to be very buttery and people love it. What I've found is if you get a buttery Chardonnay, if you have a buttery Chardonnay at home that you open oh, and you didn't think the it's very true. best thing to eat it with, the best thing that makes the butteriness of the Chardonnay kind of go down and the buttery like is buttered popcorn. It's pretty good. I'm telling you, like, it sounds like it's going to be too buttery. It sounds like it's going to be like butter overload, but they just like balance each other out. And it makes me like, I actually, we buy buttery Chardonnays now on purpose to pair, on purpose. To pair with butter popcorn. <laughs> well, cause it used to be like, I, I know one and, <laughs> and butter, buttery Chardonnays were like so denigrated. And yeah. Like but I, for a long time. For a long time. And wow. now I'm looking for them, you know? And so some of La Rochelle's I feel like are more buttery and with popcorn for movie night it is like I have a hard time eating popcorn without Chardonnay now honestly um it's so delicious so so one of those fun components about like the tenets of food and wine pairing um that is exemplified by that idea is that you're always kind of at a high level looking at how you can have a pairing that is contrasting or complementary yeah and you know obviously the Buttery, buttery, Chardonnay, buttery. The buttery popcorn, those are complimentary. Mm -hmm. But the cool part that's existing in that compliment or compliment is salt and acid go really, really well together. So the fact that you have a kind of acidic, buttery Chardonnay and then and a salty, a buttery, buttery, salty popcorn, the salt and the you know acid in the wine, those go great. And then the butteriness. You have a, a combination of the complementary idea of pairing and the contrasting yeah. idea of pairing at the same time. Um, another great way to do that is uh, champagne and Popeye's fried chicken. Yeah, champagne and fried chicken is a great, great pairing. We like it doesn't to do, have to be Popeye's. But we we like to do so high, good. but we like to do high class, low class pairings, like little high low, like yeah, champagne and fried chicken. Yes, please. Um, Jay had a good question. Yeah, he did. What's immediately clear that like the wine's going to be good? Is there some thing that you <clears throat> can look at, taste, label? Um, one thing to immediately uh, like dispel when you said look at, um, there's a common conception. Uh, yeah, that's good. In this world where after you stop swirling, you see the tears or the legs or the church windows forming and falling on the outside of the glass um and i feel like popular media ha media has i don't know what's uh i feel like in movies a lot they talk about the legs you know yeah. in movies there's like a wine person being like the legs on this are really quite lovely you know and it makes you the suggestion yeah. there is that that is indicative of quality and it's not um they're pretty to look at. They can tell you some stuff about the wine. Like alcohol content or sugar level. Things where like that. it might have been grown um, as a result, mm -hmm. sugar level and alcohol content. Uh, but nothing about the quality. And so moving on, Jay, the question about like, is there a way to kind of assess the quality level with any kind of immediate markers? And I would, I would say, probably no but you it seemed like you were gonna i was just thinking when we something. teach tasting techniques and if anyone wants us to go into yeah, tasting techniques really later point. um there is there is one thing but this is you know it's not in the store at the shelf it's once it's you not open it because it's something that takes a little bit of practice to perceive yeah and so it's it's referred to as the finish right so after you take a sip you swirl it around a little bit enjoy it in your mouth get it coated everywhere swallow it down and you're paying attention to the next 10 seconds, 30 seconds after you swallow it. And we've all had, you know, tastes of something where you take a sip, you swallow it, and you kind of get a like, oh, there was like a sharpness there, or it like burned a little bit, or like something that's a little jarring. And then we've also had things, and this is where you don't notice it as much to Evan's point where it takes some practice. When you swallow it down and 15 seconds later, 30 I mean, seconds later, counting. It's still, you can still taste it in your it's mouth a little like bit. Pinot Noir. And it's it pleasurable. It has like the measure of acidity that caused a little bit of salivation here right after I swallowed it, but it has a nice like yeah. 
velvety kind of sandpaper texture of the tannins that are keeping my mouth dry despite the fact that I'm salivating and I'm still smelling and tasting all the delicious like cherry cola and bright tart sweet baking spices and it's it's been almost a minute now yeah so yeah that's a good point because the persistence of a wine is probably the single best you know overall indicator of quality yeah and I do think you know if you're sitting there you took a sip and you're immediately wanting to take another sip right away I feel like sometimes that is an indicator that like there's something going on with the finish that you're trying to actually like clear out and like while it's in your mouth it's delicious and then okay let me take another sip let me take another sip whereas when it that has a nice long finish like that you aren't reaching for your glass again quite so quickly you're appreciating it because it's still alive in your mouth a little bit you're still getting that like enjoyment from it yeah. Um, and so that's something, you know, if you're at a party and you're tasting through wines and deciding which one you want to pour yourself a full glass of, do that, taste through and kind of just see how it, you know, lives on for a second. Um, yeah. Uh, alternatively, if you have a sip and then you're like, you're like, well, I need to take another, you might be enjoying a very nice glass of wine. It also just might be Monday. <laughs> that's true. <laughs> you might just need, need fast sips. Um, yeah, let's start, get into some pairing. J Jay was asking best pairing for a charcuterie plate. Um, let's talk a little bit about pairing and we'll talk about charcuterie as part of that, but I want to mm -hmm. show this for a minute, what I've kind of done here. And I'm going to encourage you all to go. So pillage mm, lighting here. Careful. Oh, oh. No. <laughs> so no. basically what I have on here, the lighting is not going to work for us. Right. There's a bunch of goodies, but so what I do is I go into the cupboard and I pill it. And this is honestly how I do a lot of when right we ha when we have a glass of wine. Now it's all on a white plate. I should have put it on a darker plate. Um, <laughs> yeah. But basically, this is what I do a lot of times when we open a bottle of wine. I go in our cupboard, I go in our fridge, and I kind of pull out a little mix of things, just different things that I think might go well with it, might be interesting with it. And so what I have um, is... I have two slices of lemons. Oh, we're going to move the camera. That seems risky. All right. It was a suggestion from Tom. Still. No. So we have pecans. We have pistachios. We have three different cheeses over here that are kind of the same color. And we have two wedges of lemon, basically. So what we, good luck getting that set back again. Ooh, ooh, now we're crooked. <laughs> I'm on it. Um, but so what we, and the point of this is, is the more things you try, with each glass of wine, the more you're gonna to start to learn what okay. pairs well with things. And so I like to do a variety of things. And so if I have three cheeses in the fridge, I'm gonna cut a few slices of each cheese and I'm gonna try each one with it and start to learn what works, what doesn't work, why I think that is. And then the next time I have a Chardonnay, I have a little bit more information from what went with that one. Mm -hmm. And I get to kind of keep advancing that. Um, the lemon trick, is a particular, you want to talk about why this is popular with kind of pairings to do the like lemon in your mouth and then. Yeah, you know, uh, cleansing your palate in a lot of different ways um, can be questionable and very advantageous. When you're talking, when you're learning and understanding food and wine pairing, um, playing with something that is pronounced at sure. anything at the ends of the spectrum uh, and the spectrums I'm talking about are acid, bitterness, sweetness, salt, yeah. and umami fat. Um, and oh, umami, that makes sense. Yeah, yeah I mean, umami. The flavor is not the, yeah. Yeah, and so, so those kind of four, five, I keep saying questionably like four, five, five, there's the, the jury is out whether or not umami, umami counts. I think it counts. Actually a thing. It counts. But there's also like two more past that that are yeah. in discussion. Um, but so the lemon is a proxy for acid, yeah. basically. And it's like a pure acid, whereas goat cheese that I have on the plate is also acidic, right? And so that cup, but it also has some fat to it. And so that has some like extra layers. And so a lot of times also people will do hummus, plain hummus, because that's a very like straight flavor to like. So things that are a little bit more plain as you're starting to learn how to pair, that can really help you isolate like, oh, something salty goes nice with this. Something a little sweet goes nice with this. Now let me add sweet and fat. Let me add salty and fatty, right? And so you start to kind of build on it. And 
So let's talk about how to actually pair food because like we were saying at the beginning, just eating and drinking together, that's not actually pairing, that's enjoying a glass of wine with your sure. But when you want to pair food, and so what we're looking for when we pair food is, you know, some foods when you pair them together actually makes one thing worse, right? It actually makes the wine taste flat, it makes it kind of have a bite to it, makes the food taste a little sour. That does something weird that like, oh, that was more enjoyable on its own. So that can happen to just one of them or they can both taste worse. Mm. They can both be like, I enjoy those so much better separately. And so that would be a bad pairing, right? A neutral pairing would be, doesn't really do much for either one of them. Like doesn't make it better, doesn't make it worse. And those are perfectly acceptable. Those are great to just like- That's eating and drinking. Yeah, yeah. You don't have to have them in your mouth at the same time, but they go very well together. A great pairing, the pairing that when you put it in your mouth makes you be like, oh, like really, like that is what a great pairing does is it makes the wine come alive in a different way. It brings different flavor profiles out in the wine that you didn't notice before. And it does that for the food too. And so once you try it that way, you're like, oh, I don't want to eat those separately. And it can make just one better or it can make both of them better. Both of them better is a little harder to find, but those are great, great pairings. Um, and so that's kind of what you're trying to assess. And the only way you can assess that is if you have both of them in your mouth at the same time. And so the way that you do this is we always recommend trying the wine first on its own. We also recommend trying the food by itself on its own, right? You need a baseline for each one of them. Then you want to put a little bit of food in your mouth, partially chew it, chew it about halfway, and then take a swig of the wine and finish chewing it. Not a, a big swig, a small, you know, not like you know, you're basically spitting wine out with your food, choking yourself, but take a little bit of wine in your mouth and finish chewing with the wine in your mouth. Just to interject there, swig or sip totally depends on how big of a bite of food you take. And so if you're eating a dish that has like, you know, fried prosciutto and um, risotto and, and it's a big bite and yeah. it's like a big all bite, the flavors. you need to have a cup, like the amount of wine that you have in your mouth is directly relational to how much food you have in your mouth. If you're taking a tiny little taste of caviar, you, you want to take a, a similarly bit. tiny yeah. taste of whatever champagne, ideally, yes, yes. champagne. Yeah. Uh, that you're sipping with. And so Go while ahead. they're both in your mouth, you want to just be paying attention. So this is not the time to like be really intently listening to someone else's story about what, right? I'm you're, having a conversation right here. Yeah, you're having a conversation with your wine and your food and you're really figuring out. And a lot of times when you go out to eat at a restaurant, what I like to do is there's three or four different components on your plate. Do this. This is how you learn. Again, the, the trial and error piece. Do it with every single thing on your plate separately then start to take bites of things together and do it, right? And so that's really what you wanna do here. Um, and so I would encourage all of you to go run to your cupboards, run to your fridge and just grab random stuff and like for, like pickles, dried cornichons, fruit. dried fruit, nuts, nuts cheeses, um, crackers, even if you have different flavored crackers, um, sauces. If you have sauces, you can just do a little dab of like mustard and then do, yeah. Um, and it really, you know, and see what you're kind of learning with this. Your suggestion earlier charcuterie is a, a charcuterie plate is i feel like designed to be very versatile and there's some things that arguably go better with some types of wines and beverage and some that go better with other if you're talking about for like prosciutto and capicola and actual cured and salted yeah. and smoked and dried meat, meat products Generally, you want something that's a little higher in tannins. Tannins offset the fat component that you'll get from something fatty like that. The same goes for different types of cheeses. However, um, the fattier cheeses that are like softer, sometimes the tannins alone uh, don't play well with the other components. So it's better with protein. Yeah. Um, but that's why, you know, big I'm a, cats. kind of a snickler about wine and cheese because while the, you know, everyone's like, all wine Instagram, and cheese is wonderful. Yeah. Instagram. Instagram. <laughs> yeah. Pinstick talk. Yeah. Uh, they, you know, wine and cheese is great. It is. But not all, not all wine goes great with all, all cheese. Great. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway. And as you start to play with that, because I was definitely, when he first said that to me years ago, and he's like, I mean, not all wine and cheese go well together. And I was like, what wine and cheese are you eating? But as I started to pay attention to that, he's absolutely right. 
You know, there are certain cheeses that go great with pinots. There are other cheeses that are better with calves. There are a lot of cheese, the buttery soft cheeses. I really like with Chardonnays. I really like with whites a little bit more. And I totally agree with that in the most part, but I'll have to do this next time we see it, which might not be for a while. We'll find a lot of really good soft cheeses here where we are. <laughs> Nevertheless, it's one of my biggest complaints about there, living here. <laughs> there's a soft white cheese from the homeland of Burgundy. And this is one of the most like directly contradictory things to the concept that I often talk about with regard to food and wine pairing, which is what grows together, goes, goes together. together. Um, because by and large, Chardonnay and Pinot Noir, which both come from Burgundy, pair very well with things that are also found natively in Burgundy, like mustard in the town of Dijon, which sits right in the heart of Burgundy, yeah. and mm -hmm. truffles. Truffles grow natively in the uh, oak forests that are right outside of there. And the question of whether or not the decision to grow and make wines with these grapes in, in this way came from the food that was, you know, kind of prevalent around there or that dictated what food was cultivated is a question. Um, but there's a cheese going back from Burgundy called Epoisse. Mm, I love Epoisse. And I think it's the most terrible food pairing ever with a Chardonnay that grows there that you find in I, I believe it's Merceau in the mm -hmm. southern part of the Cote de Bourne. Um it's it's very conflicting for me because I really like that ideology of pairing food and wine and I think it's one of the more important ones that I'd love to like convey because across the board there are examples of food that come from a region where there is similarly a wine that is notable of that region and they invariably go together yeah. because why wouldn't they like they would have figured that out by now uh and so if you're looking to pair food and wine look for the place where that kind of food came from and then the wine that is native to that region uh, and vice versa, like if you really like Cabernet Sauvignon, go look at the food types that have developed over 600 years. In the in really good really Cabernet regions. Right. Because right. that's the tricky thing nowadays, right? Is that you're like, well, they make Cabernet everywhere, right? And so going back to like, where are the really like amazing Cabernets coming from? You know, where are the, like, where are the best versions of that coming from? And that's kind of help, helps you narrow down a little bit. I would say for charcuterie boards, I do tend to really like Tempranillos and like Malbecs for charcuterie boards. I just feel like there's something very like approachable to them. And I don't know, maybe it is because in those cultures, you know, like in Spain, the pinchos and the little food bites that have a lot of meats in them a lot of times. And then in Argentina, well. they are really well known for meat there. Yeah. I feel like those are really approachable wines that work with quite a few different charcuterie yeah um, yeah i would agree those those would be fantastic with most things that you see on the kind of standard charcuterie. oh i like fun That's pairings like on. this jay we the, these are fun pairings if you guys don't follow wine folly you should follow wine folly because they sometimes do these weirdo but what pairs big best mac. with my local big mac hey jay is your local big mac different, different than our than... local big mac <laughs> um so that thousand island dressing is what you this is a good this this brings up a good point see you think you're being yeah. kind of funny but no, we, we we can we can teach about this <laughs> it's really true so with something like this uh where you have a fair bit of you know fat you've got the cheese and the meat you want something that has some grit um and so we're already straying into the land of like big reds cabernet sauvignon being a pretty exemplary example that people are familiar with exemplary example exemplary example that's that's a thing uh <clears throat> but very true the thousand island and particularly the vinegar component mm -hmm. with the pickles and i mean just thousand island itself i guess most of that zip is from pickles yeah. um having acid to pair with acid is super helpful um if you think about something like Sangiovese, which comes from Tuscany and is a red wine grape that's pretty high naturally in acidity. Um, but it also has a fair bit of tannin structure compared to Cabernet Sauvignon, which has less acid. 
tomatoes have a lot of acid and to acidity pairs well with acidity. So we were talking about acidity pairing well with salt earlier with the buttered popcorn and mm -hmm. buttery Chardonnay. Acidity also goes very well with acidity, which is why the classic grape of Tuscany, which is Chianti, <clears throat> very high acid wine, very high acid grape, goes so well with the food in Tuscany, which is tomatoes, or not just Tuscany, yeah. but you know, tomatoes are a very high acid fruit vegetable. Yeah. And the mother sauce, your marinara, yeah. mixed with something that's bright and vibrant like Chianti um, is another really important component of food and wine pairing. And that just goes to exemplify why what grows together goes together is such a big thing. Chardonnay with mushrooms and mustard and uh, truffles, Sangiovese with tomatoes. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, it's a really nice it's very helpful. But to summarize kind of this newer piece that you just brought up, though, basically what I've been saying is kind of sauce trumps everything, like to some, like not everything maybe, but if it's a saucy dish, if there is sauce right, on that, something. That's all I was talking about was like mustard and tomatoes. Yeah. Like what's with it? And so people, you know, back in the day, people used to say, you only drink white wine with fish and you only drink red wine with meats and like. That's not necessarily because most of the time you're not just eating a piece of fish. You're not just eating a piece of steak, right? Like there's some sauciness going on. There's a, and so you really want to think about like, does the sauce have mushrooms in it? Is the sauce like tomato based? Is the and that's what you want to help lead your choice. Um, gosh, I feel like I have to chime in with a an actual kind of pairs best recommendation. Yeah, we're not gonna let you off the hook for that. I'm not trying to <laughs> I'm volunteering. Um I feel like with that, so if I want tannins and I also want acidity, the other thing I think I want in that is high alcohol because I think that alcohol in, accentuates flavors. Mm -hmm. It accentuates spice. It accentuates um, saltiness. Um, and it's something to be aware of. Like you don't want to necessarily have a shot of tequila with the spiciest Mexican food you can find. Yeah. Um, it also accentuates sugar. So that's the reason why a lot of pastry chefs add spirits to like different kinds desserts, of pastries that right. they make and desserts that they make. But with a Big Mac, I think I would do a pretty full-bodied red Zinfandel. I was thinking Zinfandel too, for some yeah. reason. Yeah, I Malbec would work, I think, because mm -hmm. both of those have also that peppery spice on the back palate. And the one thing that I feel like I miss in something like a Big Mac is it's not spicy enough. Mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. that's why I add sport peppers when I go to In-N-Out yeah. Burger yeah. and I get my cheeseburger. You know, you just said something that made me realize a, an issue I've had with Mexican food for a long time because I love Mexican food. I love margaritas. But I've always, from a very, like, when I was younger, even in my 20s, if I would go and get the big margarita and then get Mexican at a restaurant, I would be able to take like three bites of my food and I would just kind of feel nauseous and I, or nauseated. I would kind of like not be able to finish my food. And so I start, I stopped ordering margaritas when I, and it was like so sad for me. And I think it's what you're saying maybe because I am, I'm a little sensitive to like really big flavors. Like if things are very flavorful, yeah. I get a little, like my palate gets blown out after a few bites and I start to feel full. Um, but I think the fact that there's spirits in the margarita and that's heightening my like the flavors of the food and Mexican food is already very flavorful, right. but that's probably what's going on there for me. Interesting. Yeah, that totally makes sense. Oh, fascinating. Jay, please report back with <laughs> your Zinfandel my big recommendation. Ex experience. Um, let's talk a little bit about the Pinot and then we can open it up and turn everyone's cameras on. I did try this with the lemon. It's interesting. It makes the lemon kind of sweet. Like it makes the lemon almost taste like a sugared lemon with the Chardonnay. Um, and it actually makes the Chardonnay kind of taste a little sweeter as well, I think. Well, cool. I'm going to yeah. try that. Yeah, it was kind of fun. The pecans and the pistachios, kind of neutral, like didn't make anything better or worse, I would say. Um, no, you didn't do the full. And then the goat cheese is a is a nice pairing. It doesn't, I, again, I'd say it's it's a neutral pairing. Um, and I also have an apricot cheese there and a cheddar that I haven't tried yet. So, but I did, the the lemon was was pretty fun, I thought.
Yeah, that's way cool. Right? It almost reminds me of like those lemon drop shots when we were all in college, like that sugared lemony when kind of flavor. When Absolute Citron came, uh -huh. first came out, like mm -hmm. the first flavored vodka out there, and you just like squeeze lemon and put sugar on the rum. Yeah. Uh, Steph likes it too. Yeah, I mean, it's it's fun to just, and I- that's, I mean, and that's the encouragement yeah. that Suzanne was putting forth there is that like, if you find a wine that fascinates you and you're like finding yourself spending, oh, I haven't even tried it yet. It's been 20 minutes Yeah, because I'm just, at least that's, that's Evans. for me. And then in the meantime, in those 20 minutes, Suzanne's looting through the cabinet and the fridge and freezer and finding all the things. And she's like, what do you think it would taste like with this? I'm like, I don't know. I haven't tried it yet. Yeah. And I, and I would encourage you to, to like pull some things that you're like, there's no way this would be good. Like, this is really weird, but like, I just have a feeling or I have a hunch and I just want to try it anyway. Um, because those sometimes can really shock you and really blow your mind. And I've come across some of those while we're like watching a movie or something where I'll just all of a sudden put something in front of Evan and he's like, what? And then we try it. And we're like, oh damn, that is fun. Um, so just the more, the more you do it, the better you get at it, you know? Practice makes perfect, permanent. Yeah. Uh, so the Y3 Pinot is from a single vineyard in the Russian River Valley owned by a family that has, I, I believe the largest number of non-contiguous acres of vineyards in Sonoma County. Um, this is very high quality fruit that for whatever reasons, whatever metrics the family has, and I I don't know if I can comfortably tell you the, the name of the vineyard. Um, yeah. But I and so tell some, them tell some them of you why. Tell them what the there is fruit that they sell at a certain price that they go through and they meticulously analyze every cluster and they are so on top of it and that's the first pass through the vineyard and that fruit goes into their own winery and also to other wineries that purchase their fruit and those are adorned with the name of the family vineyard so like on the bottle it would say the name of the vineyard that and, the wine the, the grapes come from and that carries a financial cachet that the family doesn't want to dilute because they will then go through the vineyard and do a second pass, a second harvest and crop the rest of the stuff that on the day that they felt was exemplary and they initially picked, a few days later, there's still really good fruit that is coming to fruition a little bit late. And they go through and they pick it and they can't, they don't want to sell it at that same price point and they well they can't sell it at the same price point mm -hmm. but they can't put their name on it at the price point that they would otherwise sell it so they sell it declassified effectually and so and that's this what is called in the industry you're buying declassified fruit from the vineyard which basically means you can buy this fruit you can make a single vineyard wine from this fruit but you cannot put the vineyard name on your bottle because it was harvested two days later it's not it's not the optimal. premium best fruit that was harvested at the perfect party, right like and as a result because they have because trent and kimberly are friends have with connections family they receive uh the opportunity to buy this fruit that makes such such a good pinot uh pinot as far as like again the dinner table around thanksgiving um this is something that is very versatile but it also can be overpowered and washed out uh, because it's comparatively delicate. Um, some Chardonnays are much more robust and can withstand more. This one without its oak influence is a little bit more um, mm -hmm. reserved. I think this Pinot can really stand up to a nice drumstick, like something fatty yeah. and pretty hearty because this is, I mean, Try this because I feel like Hold on, might... I'm doing my last food pairing with my Chardonnay. I'm being Please. diligent over I here. Apologize. Sorry. Go ahead. Um, I'm familiar with these wines and this particular vintage of the 
Y3 Pinot Noir um, is, I think, a little bit more prominently tannic than other ones that I remember. Than previous vintages? Yeah. Or... And it's actually quite pleasant, particularly with this kind of idea in mind of being able to stand up to something fatty. Tannins and fat play very well together. There's a reason that uh, you add cream to your coffee or you add cream to your tea. The fat in the cream counteracts the tannins yeah. that you find in tea and you find in coffee. When you were a little kid, you would have a piece of apple and a piece of cheese and there's tannins in the skin oh, of the kid, cheese. I do that all the time. That's yeah, true. <laughs> you do like that, Travis. Yeah. But also the, you know, it's, there's no, that's the reason why big Cabernets want a big fatty steak with them and Precisely. that is like delicious right yeah. like it's that same idea too and there's nothing like i mean you're not gonna find something quite as big and fatty as like a grilled ribeye on you know most but geez turkey legs it's christmas you might find a big ribeye we did sure, we did a big ribeye like like turkey legs ago. like you could have like a really like fat mm -hmm. encrusted skin encrusted turkey leg that's plenty fatty and having a little bit of tannins is really helpful. It kind of like peels the that that texture and that like weight of the oiliness or the greasiness in whatever kind of protein you're eating uh, off your mouth, and then introduces your palate to the next bite, especially if it's got some good acidity like this does, yeah. so that you're then yeah. salivating, and then after the fat is pulled back, the saliva kind of opens your mouth up again for the next bite. Is this Carneros as well? Or is this? This is in the Russian River Valley. Okay. Um, it is more tannic than I remember yeah. past Pinot's over there. Not unpleasantly. No, yeah, no. I think it's a really kind of welcome I think it'll make it particularly even... given the context that we're talking yeah, about. Yeah, and even better if we'd bear in mind. If we were drinking this in uh, April, I'd be like, well, I wanted something that I could just yeah. chill and drink by the pool yeah and I, re I really tend to like bigger pinots I, I don't like the super light ones and so this is this is nice in that regard yeah i think this would be great with dark meat turkey a hundred percent i actually think strangely and this, this is kind of what I do. I think this would be good with like the sweet potatoes with marshmallow for some reason. I'm not sure why the sweetness might be a little much for it, but there's something about the sweet potatoes that I think would yeah. kind of work well with this. Um, gravy, I think would work very well with this as well. So whatever, you know, who cares about the mashed potatoes? It's the gravy. The gravy would go well with this. Um, stuffing, I think would go well with either of these, honestly. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe a little better with the Chardonnay. Uh, one thing to keep in mind, since Suzanne mentioned earlier, like sauce trumps everything. Something to think about when you're thinking about sauces is, you know, some of them are more herbal yeah. driven and some of them are more spice. And that's a, you know, an important difference with Pinot Noir. Um, something that's complemented with this more often is spices. They might be sweet spices, baking spices, nutmeg, clove, you know, cin cinnamon, uh, things like that. Um, Chardonnay, on the other hand, might be better complemented with more herbaceous components. That's really more dependent on if it's an oakier Chardonnay, which can complement, you know, Chardonnay or a caramel. Ooh, try this Chardonnay. with the lemon. <laughs> the lemon kick. I mean, it's just, I, I mean, I think that's the value of doing things like that. It's like the pureness of it really helps you identify. I know what I think it does for the lemon, but. And yeah, so then with the Pinot, things that are dried and bark and root driven. So sage. Yeah, and... stuff saying the sage. Yeah. yeah, that that I agree. Those characteristics with Pinot, those are, and then with Chardonnay, you're thinking things like, um, dill and, um, you know, maybe fresh rose, not, not even rosemary. Garlic. I, I'm thinking, yeah, but I'm also thinking like herbaceous. Ah, uh, I see. So like, uh, fennel, mm -hmm. fennel frond, uh, and 
keeping that in mind when you're making dishes, like if you're making it, if you're making root vegetables and then you're putting a bunch of dill and fennel frond on it. And Think some, about and that. Some, and some butter. Yeah. Chardonnay. And then with your stuffing, with your dressing for the yeah. evening, sage and rosemary and thyme and nutmeg and clove and cinnamon and five spice and stuff like that. Yeah. Pinot. And honestly, Thanksgiving is the perfect time of year. The holidays are the perfect time of year to pour yourself a small glass of something and go take a bite of everything that's out there with that thing. And then pour yourself a glass of something different and take it like it's, it, it is the perfect like pairing experimentation platform yeah. because you're supposed to be eating all day. You're supposed to be noshing all day <laughs> and there's lots of booze around. And so you can just like play with it all. And then you can tell everyone like the fun things you're trying. Cause that's really fun when you find something that like breaks your neck a little bit and you're like, Whoa, what's that? Going and telling your family or friends like, dude, try this with that. And then getting them to experience it. It can be really a lot of fun. 100%. Hey, did you try this with a lemon? You didn't try this with a lemon. You're not listening. Sorry. <laughs> Hey, Pinot Noir and pizza, kudos. Yeah. Oh. The tomato sauce, the acidity in the tomato sauce and the acidity in Pinot Noir, and then the some Pinot Noirs, this one, having a little bit more tannin structure to kind of yeah. brace the oiliness that, I mean, I've had pizzas where I have to like either Solid put a bunch of Parmesan cheese on top of it or put a napkin on top yeah. of it. The tannins that you find in this, when, perfect. Yeah. 100%. Yeah, for sure. All right. I think we should open mm -hmm. it up to happy hour style. What do you think? Mm -hmm. So people can just get on camera and tell us what they're planning yeah, on. We'd love to see your faces. Yeah, we'd love to see your faces. We'd love to hear what you're planning join on. Or don't join us when we invite you and let's let's yeah. share because we And let's let's do I know a lot of times some people drop off because it makes them a little nervous that we're letting people turn, but you don't have to turn your camera on. You can still say incognito. But in case you do have to drop off, thank you for joining us tonight. We hope you have a wonderful Thanksgiving and we hope that gobble, this gobble, encourages gobble. you to try a lot of different wines with foods and figure out like what works and what doesn't and report back. Let us know what you find that's kind of shocking or surprising or. We hope that these two are as accessible as possible because yeah. I do feel like they're very versatile and the fun is branching out from these wines. And if you like them, if you go online and order them now, like we said, they're very reasonably priced, so, which is perfect for the holidays because as people drink throughout the day, you don't want to have like these super crazy expensive bottles out there, right? So these are really nice for that. And I think maybe if you order today, you you might be able to get them in time for Thanksgiving next week. They're pretty on it with yep. the shipping and they turn things around very quickly. So um, yeah, I think that might Please work. Please do so yeah. if you like them. And don't forget, if you aren't a Sip Scout member currently, we have the amazing holiday experience coming up next month. So order that by the end of the month so that- We've got a s'mores old fashioned, in. a spiced cranberry gimlet and- Gingerbread espresso martini. So we're going to have a lot of fun for that. So, all right, I'm going to, um, you'll get a notification on your thing that you can be upgraded to panelist and- Happy holidays until we say happy holidays next Happy time. Thanksgiving, and then we'll say yes. Merry Christmas next time. But cheers, cheers. everyone.